Let's bring us up to speed on where does it stand now and what kind of work does the Weston A. Price Foundation do in that topic? Well, raw milk is regulated by the states, which is a good thing because at least you have a chance of making changes. It's slower, but uh, over the years, we have uh, increased the number of states that allow farmers to provide raw milk from 27 to 46. No, 44, 44. We have still six, seven, six states where you can't do this, but... Um, we have a website, realmilk.com, and we've just revised it and put up a beautiful interactive map. And anybody in the country can go on that website and find the raw milk that's close to them, including drop-off points, farmers markets, et cetera. So uh, I, I, I'm a farmer in the state of Maryland and um, we were able to get a permit uh, about four or five years ago to sell raw milk labeled as pet food, which is a kind of loophole, but it works. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a real demand for raw milk. And I think the states are realizing that this argument that raw milk is deadly dangerous is not correct. Uh, we have ways of testing for cleanliness right on the farm. We test every batch of our milk and it's uh, inexpensive and easy and accurate. And so uh, we have the technology today to produce really clean raw milk and there's absolutely no reason to be opposed to it. And in fact, that opposition has died down. And as I say, we're making great progress on this. We have a, a long ways to go, but um, anyone who wants raw milk pretty much anywhere can find it. The manager that I was working with on my raw milk story mm -hmm. was, a, I would say, I would say opposed to raw milk. So it was interesting. <laughs> and I, I think we, we probably had um, some more fiery conversations than typical uh, for, for us when we were putting this together. But one of the things that he said that I thought was really interesting was that I think at the time he pointed me to a CDC write-up that said there's no difference in nutrition between yeah, raw milk. Yeah, that's what they and, say. And, that's what and, they and, say, right. Well, but it's, it's, well, it's crazy to me, I guess, that uh, it doesn't make any sense, I guess, if I go back to my ninth grade uh, chemistry class. I don't understand how you, you boil something or you heat something and then you say it's exactly the same. It seemed like the whole point of boiling would be to change something. That's what it yeah. does, I thought. Yeah. But maybe it my science is... It destroys all the enzymes. But if you do an analysis of raw milk and you'll find the same amount of calcium in both raw and pasteurized milk, or you find the same amount of iron in both raw and pasteurized milk. But when la laboratory animals are given pasteurized milk, their bones are weaker and they are anemic. And that's because the iron and the calcium are not absorbed properly. What is killed when you um, pasteurize are all the enzymes that allow you to absorb the milk, absorb all the nutrients in the milk. Every single vitamin and mineral in raw milk has an enzyme that in ensures 100% assimilation, and there's no other food like this. So it's the perfect food for people who have compromised digestion, for example, because they can't make enzymes to assimilate their food. Well, raw milk has them all. It's, it's a great healing food. It's a perfect food for growing children because all of the uh, minerals are completely absorbed. A child who grows up in raw milk will have beautiful, uh, uh, durable teeth that are resistant to decay, even if the child is eating sugar and stuff. The raw milk is very protective. And the pasteurized milk, the other problem with pasteurized milk is that when those proteins in milk are heated, they become highly allergenic. And fewer and fewer people can drink raw milk without having digestive problems. And that's why the consumption of fluid milk is going down to one to 3% per year and has done relentlessly for the past 40 years. And now that most milk is ultra pasteurized, um, fewer and fewer people, especially children, can even tolerate it. Since the milk world brings up some of the issues with maintaining uh, a small farm or a farm that goes direct to consumer in today's world, because I think that's where a lot of the raw milk consumer base is, though. I could buy mine at a grocery store near me too. So um, I, I don't know if that's just because there's more demand for it. You don't oh, have to. What state are you in? Washington. Yeah. So uh, there are 10 states where you can buy raw milk in stores. Um, 
Uh, and, you know, do these states have people falling dead from drinking raw milk? Uh, no, the answer is no. In fact, we haven't had an illness attributed to raw milk for the last two years. Uh, and there have been lots of illnesses attributed to pasteurized milk products. So th the next question I have, actually, I want to I want to hold off on one second because I was going to ask you about how that how how this is an example of other things that we're dealing with in the food world right now that make it more challenging what people should know in order to become better consumers of it. But let me just bring up the counterpoint that this food board illness attorney told me when I was in his Skyrise um, office in downtown Seattle with his treadmill well, right there. I know who that was. I'm trying to think of his name. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can't I think debated either. him a few times. <laughs> um, so yeah, he he would think that uh, hey, if you're an adult, you're 18 years old, whatever, you you want to drink raw milk, then fine. But that a parent that's putting their their kid in the situation to drink raw milk with the the uh, possibility of having a severe uh, bacterial illness, illness or something like that. He, that's what he would say to me. I remember that very clearly, like, Hey, you're an adult. You want to drink it. You want to take the risk. Yeah, Go for yeah, it. But that's it's, what he it's said to me too. What do you say to that? You know, I have four grandsons all brought up in raw milk. They are the healthiest, uh, most attractive children. Um, beautiful teeth. I don't think there's a cavity in any of the four. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's child abuse to deny this wonderful food to your children. We will get to the rest of this video in just one second, but before we do, don't forget the holiday clock is ticking and what better gift idea that allows you to support my work and free speech while also having a robust glass of ball back and a piping hot cup of coffee. First, check out Allison with 1LWinePromo.com. You get 50% off some of my favorite high altitude Malbecs from Argentina and one even comes from the oldest vineyard in Argentina. Plus you get 50% off shipping. They pair very well with the desserts you will be having with grandma while you debate all of the hottest topics around us right now. Or speaking of hot, have a hot cup of coffee with twinenginecoffee.com slash Allison. Also with 1L Allison, these are high altitude shade grown USDA certified organic Nicaraguan roast. The CEO and founder of the company lives right there in Nicaragua where they grow, harvest, and roast the beans. There's also a Katura tea. If you're a tea drinker, this is tea that you make out of the coffee fruits. You can have it hot or cold. I like to cold brew mine for 24 hours. Both options, the hot or cold, very good, as are the coffees, as is also the wine. So check out my sponsors and toast to free speech wherever you are this holiday season. Is the organic label worth the extra price? How trustworthy is USDA organic? And many times the meat from regenerative farms may be priced out of the budget for a family of limited means. How can that family optimize their nutrition on a limited budget? Yeah. Well, um, that's a good question about organic. I mean, even organic wheat still has glyphosate in it um, because it comes from neighboring farms or whatever. But I still think it's worth it. Uh, I think we should support the farmers who are trying to do this in a sustainable way. Even better is to find farms near you that um, uh, are doing things the right way without chemicals and maybe help them organize deliveries or whatever. Um, so the cost of all this. <laughs> so when, you're, when you are adding up your food costs, your food budget, it's not just the food you buy in the supermarket. It's the, the meals that you eat out and your health costs, your, you know, prescription, your doctor's visits. Uh, so that is the cost of food. And I think a lot of people find that if they really clean up their diet, um, that overall cost goes down. But there's also a lot of things you can do. Um, you buy a whole chicken. I remember my daughter calling me from college and she said, mom, I figured out I can buy a whole chicken for the price of two skinless chicken breasts. Mm -hmm. You buy a whole chicken, you learn to make a whole chicken. Right. Uh, you learn to stretch out the leftovers for three or four meals. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll save money. Uh, another thing is breakfast cereals. Those boxes of breakfast cereals are extremely expensive. Uh, four to $5 each. There's a penny's worth of grain in those boxes and they're absolute garbage. And they'll make you sick. Um, they cause digestive disorders. Uh, learn to make oatmeal. 
um, you know, <laughs> it yeah. costs almost nothing to make oatmeal and then you can afford to put butter or cream on your oatmeal and a natural sweetener. Learn to make your own salad dressing. You can make your own salad dressing with the finest of ingredients for less than it costs to buy those garbage uh, salad dressings in the grocery store. So there's a lot of little tricks that you can do to keep your food budget down. This person is asking about something I think we already touched on, but if there's anything else you'd like to add about it, are you aware of big food trying to shut down out small farmers? I read an article about this happening to the Amish. How many states allow raw milk to be sold? We, and we touched on that too. Is there anything else though about that you'd like to add? Well, I, you know, I, I feel like we've made progress with the small farms. The number of small farms is growing. The farmer's markets are growing. Mm -hmm. uh, I know around uh, where we live, there's maybe a dozen farms now doing uh, pork in the woods and pastured beef and stuff. So my, my sense is this is growing. Um, uh, as far as the raw milk, uh, when we say available, <laughs> So we mean either you can sell it or you can do a herd share or a cow share and, or you can sell it as pet milk. Uh, so, so we have 44 states now where that's possible. I heard you in another interview saying that you eat a half a stick of butter every day. Is right. that true? Yeah, at least. Okay. And do you just eat it straight or do you put it in something? No, I, <laughs> I put it on bread. I put it on uh, sourdough bread, of course. I put it on okay. my vegetables. I... Uh, I had oatmeal this morning. I had about three or four tablespoons of butter on my oatmeal. <laughs> so how does that help uh, one's immune system or just oh, overall yeah. health? And let's talk generally not just butter, but fats. Like what are the best fats? And, and, and are those lacking in the American diet right now and contributing to the problems that we're seeing with uh, – the health of the average American. Yeah, absolutely. The, the worst thing, the thing that has caused the most disease, the most suffering in our children, um, the most cancer, uh, the most uh, learning problems is the industrial seed oils, also called vegetable oils. They're a, a slow poison over the generations. And the very first thing we say is not give up sugar. I know that's hard. Give up all these industrial seed oils. It means that you will not be eating processed foods, okay? Because that's what they're made of. Um, and then embrace the healthy traditional animal fats. That's butter, uh, beef fat called tallow, uh, lard. Uh, we keep a nice little can of bacon fat by the stove and cooking that a lot. So there you're, you're not paying anything for that fat. It's just leftover. Uh, these are the stable, healthy fats, and they, they're healthy because they're stable and also because they contain very important vitamins. And everybody's talking about vitamin D. Uh, we measured a thousand units of vitamin D in one tablespoon of pastured lard. Mm. There's the answer to your vitamin D problem. So as, as far as butter is concerned, butter is the fat in nature for the growth and development of all mammals, including human mammals. There can't be anything wrong with it. And in fact, it is absolutely necessary in children's diets. Uh, we, they need that butter, for, there's special fats in butter that you can't duplicate, that you can't uh, imitate in margarine or spreads that are very important for uh, skin health, for reproductive health, uh, for digestive health, and my goodness, we have so many digestive problems in our children today. I mean, the first thing is eat butter. Have any of your recommendations about fats changed over the years? Well, um, like any well, aha moments, you know, where I, like, know. Oh, I mean, uh, this is how we started out. I worked with Mary Ennig, who was a um, a lipid biochemist, and she shared all of my concerns and agreed with me, or I agreed with her, we agreed with each other. And, uh, you know, this is just the number one thing is these vegetable oils are completely new to the human diet. They started in about 1900. And this industry became so powerful that they basically took over the medical profession and the advertising industry, and they have subjected us to 100 years of propaganda against saturated animal fats or saturated coconut oil. Coconut oil is a good fat too. You want saturated fats because they're stable. 
They don't break down. They support hormone production. They support um, enzyme, uh, you know, enzyme production and enzyme, uh, the way the enzymes work. So um, th there's absolutely nothing wrong with saturated fats. They're, I mean, your cell membranes are at least 50% saturated and your brain is the most highly saturated organ in the body and it has to be that way or it's not going to work. Okay. Sorry. I did the wrong layout there. As I was clicking back over to check on another question that I got, uh, what does your farm consist of? If people are thinking about moving on to a small farm, what is a good size and location? <laughs> oh dear. So we have a small dairy farm. Uh, we make uh, raw cheese. We um, sell pet milk. We, and we're in Southern Maryland, by the way, in case you want to know where we are, uh, we um, feed the way to the pigs and we have pigs in the woods. We do uh, chicken and eggs. Um, I think our farm is too small. It's 95 acres. I think to be um, sustainable and profitable, you need about 200 acres. Dang. That's, other, a, that's a lot of land, especially. That's expensive in today's world. Yeah. Uh, especially if you want to be near a, um, an urban area, yeah. because that's very important too. That's where your customers are. Mm -hmm. So, um, I used, <laughs> I used to say, basically if you want to, if you want to sell, what if, if it's just, you want a homestead, you want to go somewhere and raise your own animals or have a cow, have a milk. Yeah. Cow. Okay. Um, start with a cow. You need start a with source of income. You need a source of income. One one of the couple has to be working or something. You can't do this on nothing. And I'm very careful now about what I say about getting into farming. I think it's wonderful. We love our life. We love providing this good food. But you have to have resources or mm -hmm. it's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Farmers are some of the most stressed out people I've ever they are. Uh, they met. Are. I, I mean, I perfectly understand. 